Assalamu alaikum. Today I'm gonna give you a general overview of literary theory. It's a very daunting task, but I would make sure that I do justice to it to some extent. I expect you guys to pay attention because this is something that's gonna change your life forever. Well, to define literary theory is to embark on a journey in which we have to deal with the 12 Herculean labors. So I'm trying to say that it's not easy to define literary theory. To put it very simply, literary theory is a lens through which you evaluate, assess, dissect and understand a literary text. So the first theory that we would be talking about is new criticism. Well, this is a 1920 phenomena and uh, the critics of that time realized one thing that people were too much concerned about the materialistic aspects of literature and people were so keen on looking into the socio-economic and political aspects of things. So in this way, you're not really acknowledging art. So what the new critics preach is that we need to stick to the text and not outside of it. We need to completely divorce ourselves from the socio-economic and political realities of a text. There are certain fallacies in which you look into the lives of the author and you even register the impact that a literary text has on a particular reader. You don't look into these things. All right. What you need to focus on is the text alone. T.S. Eliot had a lot to do with the flourishing of this particular philosophy. And in his essay that is titled Tradition and Individual Talent, he has stressed a lot on tradition and depersonalization. So these are the aspects that we need to look into. First of all, we need to have a thorough understanding of tradition and secondly, we need to understand how essential it is to completely omit your personality from a literary text. So this is the kind of approach us critics need to adopt in order to move forward and look into a literary text. There are so many other new critics and even if you look into the American new criticism, the critics have a very similar opinion about it. Well, they argue that we have so many different approaches and there's so much content uh, in the literary world that might not be essential. There are so many things that uh, contain unnecessary scientific facts and unnecessary historical information that might not be needed at all. So what we need to do is we need to completely shift our focus on the text and on the structure and on the form and this is how we would get down to a certain meaning. So there's a very important question that lies in the metaphysics of uh, literary theory and that is where does meaning reside? So if you look at it from a new critical perspective, the meaning lies within the text and within the structure and it does not lie beyond that. And now we'll be moving on to Russian formalism. The Russian formalists have a similar stance and some of uh, the Russian formalists decided to join hands with the new critics. So if we talk about one of the most prominent uh, Russian formalists, that is Jacobson, well, he broke free from the Russian formalists and later on he joined the new critics. 
and he showcased his understanding regarding the assessment of a literary text. Russian formalists have a slightly different stance compared to the new critics. New critics are focused on the text and they eulogize poetry a lot. But things are different with Russian formalists. They do not only look into poetry, they do look into the novel as well. And they have talked about a very important thing and they have rendered certain elements which are essential in terms of uh, crafting a literary piece. And the thing about Russian formalists is that Russian formalists actually gave uh, this particular perspective because they were too tired of looking at uh, things from uh, a Marxist perspective, the materialistic aspects concerning a text. So they wanted to uh, uh, go for an approach that was actually complementing the art and not the ideology associated with art. And there's a very important uh, matter that is part of it and uh, that is defamiliarization. So they argue that for a text to be literary it has to be made different so that the audience could have a much more uh, unique experience and the text that is defamiliarized that has a much more sound impact and it could be categorized as something that is literary. So moving on to the reader response theory or the reader oriented theory, the, over here the crux is that the meaning lies with the reader. It, it doesn't matter who the reader is, every single person has his or her own understanding of life. So based on his or her experiences, that person would actually assess literature in that particular domain. So there are certain tools uh, which have been rendered by uh, the critics uh, pertaining to reader oriented criticism and they have actually shown as to what kind of tools we could uh, make use of in order to dissect a literary text. But a reader has to be informed in order to evaluate a certain text. If a reader is not informed, he or she cannot get down to a certain meaning. So the reader should have a complete understanding of the emerging literary trends and the things that have been produced way before uh, a certain time period. Moving on to Marxist criticism. Well. Marxist evaluation of a text concerns evaluating the class differences and evaluating uh, the production houses and their relationship with the workers and classism in which we discuss uh, the characters and to which class they actually belong and what kind of relationship do they have with each other. So this is the kind of thing that we explore in literary texts. So when we look into a literary text, what we are most concerned about is what is going on uh, as far as uh, material, material relationships are concerned. So it's something that's targeted in terms of assessing and evaluating relationships between different classes and relationship between production, production houses and the people who are working in it and how all the system is contributing in terms of uh, you know the, the, the societal construct. So these are uh, some of the things which uh, you look into when you're actually uh, talking about Marxism. So the bedrock uh, of uh, Marxist criticism is base and superstructure. Base is basically the socio-economic relationship and the structure, the superstructure is actually the one that is based on that particular base and superstructure is something that comprises 
of state institutions that actually perpetuate certain ideology that is based on the socio-economic relationships of classes and production houses and things like that. So moving on to the next type of criticism that is structuralism. Well, to make it uh, uh, very short, structuralism is all about the connection between a signifier and signified, which could prove to be uh, very logical. It's for sure that actually brings up this concept and uh, he later had to revise this concept. Well, according to him, well, images and texts have this relationship. Let's say there's this particular object, you assign uh, a name to that object, let's say it's a cat and you would have this image of a cat in your mind and you actually uh, assign a name to that particular cat. So the cat is, that is, uh, ca the cat is signified and the meaning that you associate with that cat is the signifier. So the relationship between the signifier and the signifier happens to be arbitrary. It means there is no logical relationship. Just like at a signal you come across a red light and you stop. Well, there is no logical connection between the red light and stop. If you are someone who is into movies, if you are someone who is uh, uh, watched the latest uh, edition in uh, Doctor Strange franchise, you would see that when Do Doctor Strange enters a different universe, well, over there uh, they have to stop at a green light. So, that was something that actually tested his logic. So, it means that uh, this is something that culturally varies, this is something that is different in different societies. So the relationship between the signifier and signified keeps changing depending on the circumstances, depending on the time period, depending on the logical understanding of uh, a particular time period and stuff like that. Well, post-structuralists believe that uh, text has multiple meanings and there are certain ways through which you could deconstruct and come down to a different meaning than uh, what you had assumed before. Well, uh, they have actually slammed the initial concept which uh, Sosho gave, uh, which, in which he was concerned about the relationship between the signifier and signified. Post-structuralists believe that the signifier keeps changing with the passage of time and there could be so many meanings associated with it. So this is why we have the Derridean deconstruction, we have uh, Lacanian uh, deconstruction uh, in which he says that the text has its own unconscious and it could be uncovered, it could be evaluated you know with certain uh, psychoanalytical parameters and we have uh, Foucault's discourse in which he says that uh, the discourse is connected with power and stuff like that. So the relationship between the signifier and signifier happens to be quite dynamic and then we come across very complicated terms such as Lang and Perot. Uh, Lang happens to be the existing language and Perot is our version of a particular language and what we draw from it. So this happens to be quite the complicated concept and uh, the more we look into it, the more we get to learn. But this is something that demands more attention. So this is why I would be making uh, a much more detailed video on this soon enough. So moving on uh, to the next form of criticism that is psychoanalytical criticism. Well, in psychoanalytical criticism, the focus happens to be on human psychology. Well, based on Freud's case studies, we have come up with certain tools and techniques 
through which we actually evaluate texts. Well, according to the Freudian, Freudian psychoanalysis, the human unconscious is, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the human psyche has three parts, the id, the ego, and the superego. Your id contains your uh, instinctive self that is more wild, that is, uh, you know, more barbaric, and that has uh, your primitive instincts instilled in it. And when we talk about uh, superego, your superego is something that teaches you what's right or what's wrong. And this is something that has been set up by the society. So you get to know as to how you're supposed to be reacting, you know, uh, in a certain setting and in a certain environment. And the intermediary between id and superego happens to be the ego. It creates balance between id and superego. And he also gives us a concept uh, of uh, Oedipal complex in which he says that there is a certain stage when a male child is attracted towards his mother and uh, his unconscious and his upbringing psychologically speaking is quite impacted because of that. The, his uh, one of his top students, uh, who is Jung, he actually criticized some of Freud's beliefs, but uh, it doesn't mean that uh, Freud's contribution to psychoanalytical criticism was undermined in any way, because he is ultimately the father of psychoanalytical criticism. And the ones who came subsequently, they followed suit, they did have some uh, minor uh, disagreements, but uh, more or less it's Freud's psychoanalytical criticism which happens to be the base of uh, psychoanalytical criticism. So uh, he talks about Electra complex as well in which a female child is attracted towards her father. and even if a person grows up and has a family that is something that Im that still impacts uh, a person's psyche that particular belief that is instilled in one's mind so this happens to be quite complicated it's the unconscious that actually creates and actually dominates uh, one's personality and it actually impacts one's decision making as well so this was uh, you know a brief overlook of uh, uh, this was a brief overview of uh, psychoanalytic analytical criticism now moving on to the next theory that is post colonialism uh, in post colonialism we discuss the relationship between the colonizer and the colonized well, the reason why the colonizer did what they did is because they thought that they were a superior race and they were actually, in a way, they felt entitled to reform other races and other nations who they consider beneath them. They believe that it's a God-given duty that they have to reform those other countries, other nations, other people and they found themselves to be superior because they were white and the rest of the, uh, the people who were residing uh, in other parts of the world, they were not. So this is the bedrock of uh, post-colonial criticism. Uh, you would come across so many scholars who have talked about so many things. Uh, initially, this is something that uh, you know, uh, people started investigating after Edward Said, you know, published his uh, uh, book Orientalism. And after that, people started looking into this aspect as to how the colonizers 
completely changed the lifestyles of uh, the colonized and they are the ones who are struggling with their identity even even though their colonizers are gone so it's something that falls under the category of uh, imperialism now even though uh, the colonizers are not directly dealing with a certain nation but uh, their ideas their ideology and uh, the way they operate it still impacts the former colonies so you would come across bhaba spivak uh, and a host of other uh, post colonial critics who have uh, rendered their services in this particular uh, area of study moving on to uh, post modernism and uh, post colonial uh, studies happen to be part of uh, post modernism in a certain way well things uh, take a dramatic shift when we move on to post modernism we come down to the relationship uh, between images we talk and uh, simulations and the text and stuff like that and uh the relationships uh, you know th that we discussed uh, in the light of post modernism happen to be quite complicated if you talk about simulations which are happening these days and if i bring up the example of mickey mouse you would understand this one thing that uh, mickey mouse is not a real mouse you know what a real mouse looks like so they have generated this uh, cartoon this uh, image of a mouse uh, that uh, children come across and they find that to be very appealing similarly if you if you're someone who who has enjoyed tom and jerry and i doubt if uh, there, there is someone who exists and he uh, does not like tom and jerry well tom and jerry are uh, you know are characters that are quite different from their uh, uh, from which they were inspired tom is not like a real cat it's very uncharacteristic for a real cat to behave in a way which uh, in which tom does similar is the case with jerry sometimes they're friendly sometimes they're not sometimes they're fighting over things sometimes uh, you know but this is not something that you would come across in real life but this is what the children are watching and this is uh, something uh, that is actually uh, changing their sensibility of things so uh we're living in a world that is full of different narratives and it's really hard to understand as to where the truth lies so the bedrock of postmodernism is that there's no such thing as truth there are multiple truths there are subjective truths there are multiple realities and there are subjective realities every single person has his or her own reality this happens to be quite the complicated concept and uh, inshallah i'll be doing a separate video on uh, postmodernism just so that you could have a thorough understanding of uh, this particular aspect and uh, moving on to feminism when uh, in feminism we actually discuss the representation of women in texts and their relationships with their male counterparts there were uh, three major movements in feminism and uh, they actually deal with uh, quite the complicated concepts so i would be covering that as well so to put it very simply fem feminism is all about discussing uh, the representation of a female character in a literary text so this is it for today i hope that now you have a more sound understanding of literary theory it's quite the complicated subject but with the passage of time you would uh, manage to understand as to how powerful something like this actually is and if you're someone who has anything to do with literature it's really important that you go down this particular path and see what literary theory has to offer to you
all right so if you like the video please subscribe and share thank you